Well, if you haven't realized it by now, our discipleship training is starting up today. That's why we're here at 8.30. It will kick off at 9.45, 10 o'clock right here. So if you're staying for discipleship training, please stay in the sanctuary at the end of service. We'll be meeting here, and it'll kick off. Don't worry about your children. We have you covered. You don't have to go get them, recheck them in. All of that's taken care of as we continue moving forward in discipleship. Speaking of discipleship, it is my pleasure to introduce our guest speaker today. And the reason I say speaking of discipleship, because many pastors, many teachers on the pulpit are what I would say gardeners. They're ready to show you the light, <laughs> encourage you to receive that sunlight, to receive the water. They teach you how to be planted. But our guest speaker today goes beyond gardening. He is a horticulturist. He provides us with knowledge and training regarding conservation, restoration, teaches us about pruning and how it's necessary and all of that. So it is my pleasure this morning to present to you all Dr. Adewuya. Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here this morning. Let's rise up for the reading of the word and then we'll pray. I want you to turn your Bibles with me to Haggai, it's in the Old Testament, the book of Haggai, chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 1, when I get there myself, Haggai <laughs> chapter 1, from verse 1. In the second year of Darius, the king on the first day of the sixth month, the word of the Lord came by the prophet Haggai to Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, saying, Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people says, The time has not come, even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. Then the word of the Lord came by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you to yourselves to dwell in your paneled houses, while this house lies desolate? Now therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. You have sown much, but harvest little. You eat, but there is not enough to be satisfied. You drink, but there is not enough to become drunk. You put on clothing, but no one is warm enough. And you earn earns wages to put into a purse with holes. Thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, go up to the mountains, bring wood and rebuild the temple, that I may be pleased with it and may glorify, says the Lord. You look for much, but it comes to little. When you bring it home, I blow it away. Why, declares the Lord of hosts, because of my house which lies desolate while each of you runs to his own house. Therefore, because of you, the sky has withheld its dew and the earth has withheld its produce. I call for a drought on the land, on the mountains, on, on the grain, on the new wine, on the oil, on what the ground produces, on men, on cattle, and on all the labor of your hands. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God has sent him. And the people showed reverence for the Lord. Then Haggai, the messenger of the Lord, spoke by the commission of the Lord to the people, saying, I am with you, declares the Lord. So the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Jehozadak, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and walked on the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. On the 24th day of the sixth month in the second year of Darius the king. Let's pray. Our God and our Father, we want to express our gratitude to you this morning for the privilege of coming together in your house. Thank you because your word says in your presence is the fullness of joy and in your right hand are pleasures forever. Thank you, Lord, because we've not come together as a club. We've got not come together as a social gathering. We've come together to the presence of the King of kings and Lord of lords. And so, Father, as we present ourselves before you this morning, I pray, Lord, you will minister to us by your spirit. 
Lord, I pray that you anoint these lips of clay and speak through me that which you want your people to hear. Lord, may I not say a word that you do not intend for your people. May I not say beyond what you want me to say. May I not hold back by your spirit what you want me to say. Lord, I lean upon you this morning. I depend upon you this morning. Lord, I pray you anoint my lips and anoint the eyes of your people with eyes out to see wonderful things in your word and anoint our ears to hear. Lord, I ask that your name will be glorified. You will be exalted. We will be edified. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We rejoice in your presence. In Jesus' name, amen. amen. Thank you. You may be seated. Once again, it's such a joy and privilege to be here this morning to share the scriptures with you. I've uh, been here for quite a number of times, and I always enjoy myself every time I come. And I want to say thank you to the pastor for just having me to be able to fellowship with you. I always like to come here, and I probably will be here in another five years. <laughs> no, <I'm> just joking. <laughs> I mean, that's to say that it's a long time I've been here last, and I'm so pleased and Happy to see all that the Lord has been doing since I last came. And to him be the glory for all that he has done. This morning I want to share with you just for a few minutes on revisiting our priorities. Revisiting our priorities. Uh, one of the difficulties of being invited as a guest preacher and you are not told what to preach is actually knowing what to preach. That's sometimes very difficult. You wish that the person who invites you will tell you this is what I want you to preach, then you can prepare because but once it doesn't tell you what to preach, that puts you in a difficult situation. Because you, okay, God, what am I going to say? Sometimes you hear, sometimes you don't hear, sometimes you make it up, sometimes you say, okay, God, what exactly? And you don't know the congregation, but at such a time, you just depend on God. That God, you have something for your people. And I'm trusting that God has something for us this morning. And all we need to do is just listen carefully. I mean, sometimes you want to go to a place and you want to preach a message that everybody will jump up and shout. But sometimes you don't have to do that. You just have to preach what God wants you to preach. So this morning, I want to talk about revisiting our priorities. I'm sure you, when I read Haggai to you, would have expected me to read Philippians chapter 4. My God shall supply all your needs according to his riches and glory. Or you want me to read Psalm 23. No, but that's not the direction the Lord has led me. I'm going the direction the Lord has led me this morning. Revisiting our priorities. When we talk about priorities, by virtue of the word itself, a priori, from the Latin word prior, it means something that is of supreme value, something that is of supreme importance. And one of the things we need to do is at least identify our priorities before we, if we ever had some and we've lost them, to revisit them. You see, as I preach this message for this short time this morning, there are three possible attitudes that we may all have. The first attitude is, well, some of us say, yeah, I'm out of focus, and therefore you are afraid of what God might ask you to do. You are afraid of the implications of rearranging your priorities, what it might mean for you as a Christian today. Well, some of us might just be happy that, okay, God, thank you, because I've worked hard enough to align my priorities with the teachings of the scriptures, and I know that there's room for improvement. And there'll be a third group among us who will feel that, well, my priorities are just fine, and I don't need any reevaluation. I mean, you just feel that, no, 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 this message is not for me. My priorities are in the right place. There's nothing to readjust. There's nothing to look at. So you might fall into one of those three groups. The first group of people who are afraid, oh, I don't want to hear this morning because I want to do what I want to do. 
I want to go my own way. I don't want anything to tamper with the way I am going now. And then the second group are people who say, well, I know I've been trying my best, but I think there's need for revaluation. I hope that's where you fall into this morning. To lead us to, lead to, to dream beyond our current limitations. To guide us to challenge us. Now, I'm going to go into the text right away because I really don't have a lot of time. So, I'm going to dig into a guy. I mean, the other passage I would have loved to read to you is the one we know very well, which is Matthew chapter 6 from verse 25 to 34. And we all know it. Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and other things will be added unto you. That is a counterpart of the passage I'm reading this morning. But I just want to go through the scriptures with you. Number one, this diagnosing misplaced priorities. We need a diagnosis. We want to see the children of Israel. Here were the people in Jerusalem, and they thought their priorities were just fine. In Agai chapter 1. In the second year of Darius, God comes to them, and he spoke to them. Thus says the Lord of hosts, these people say, the time has not come. Everything is fine. Even the time for the house of the Lord to be rebuilt. The word of the Lord came by the Agai the prophet. Is it time for you to dwell in your paneled houses? Let me lay the ground for you a little bit to understand what was going on here. Shortly after returning from 70 years in Jerusalem, they rebuilt the walls under the leadership of Nehemiah. They also laid the foundation for the Jewish temple under the leadership of the Jewish priest Ezra. But that was 16 years earlier. 16 years have now gone and nothing has been done. They started out strong, but something happened and they lost their focus. They started very well. They were doing what God wanted them to do. They were repairing the temple. They were rebuilding the walls 16 years earlier. But something happened along the line, and they lost their focus, and they missed the target. Where they were going, they just forgot. And as I'm talking to you this morning, I want you to examine your ways and ask yourself, have I lost my focus? Where was I three years ago? Where was I in my journey five years ago? I don't like talking theories. I want you to ask yourself, how is your Bible reading? I want you to ask yourself, how is your prayer life? I want you to ask yourself, how is your devotion? We are growing old, but we are not growing up. Are we making progress in our spiritual life? We are telling stories. I'm a chartered member of Healing Waters, uh, Healing Waters Worship Center. Great, you are a chartered member. What progress have you made? I've come to challenge you. I've come to provoke you as the Lord has placed in my heart. Have you missed your focus? Have you missed your focus when it comes to the work of the Lord? Are you getting hotter? You see, they told us in geography several years ago, I remember now, they said, the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. That's what they told us. Well, later on, they, they said, until you get to the tropopos. But the higher you go, the cooler it becomes. And it seems that in the lives of so many believers today, the higher they go, the cooler they become. The longer they are in the church, the less committed they become. The longer they, they are in the Lord, the less their prayer life. You remember very well when you could kneel down and bow and go to the gate of heaven and say, God, I want it now. You can tell it by yourself when your faith was burning like a fire and you could just hold anything, you could hold the storm. I'm asking you, where are you now? How are you now? He said, oh, come on. Pastor, you didn't just come to condemn us. No, I didn't come to condemn you. I came to challenge you. I came to challenge you. Doesn't the Bible says provoke one another unto love? I came to challenge you. You knew the days when you and your wife would kneel down and both of you would decree a sin and would be established. Let me ask you, husband and wife, when last did you pray together? When last did you, I don't mean the little thing with those, oh, bless this food, oh, Lord, for Christ's sake. Meaningless prayer. And that's not what I'm talking about. 
If I ask you now, what does it mean? When you say, bless this food, all of for Christ, you don't even know what it means. Because when you say, bless this food, all of, what do you want him to do? Multiply it. Eat part of it. I mean, we just pray. We, we pray without thinking. Bless this food, all of for Christ's sake. Amen. What does it mean? Okay, think about that. That's your exam. <laughs> what, what I'm saying is, when last, when last did you and your wife decide to fast together? Decide to fast together. Seek the face of God over your children. Seek the face of God over your business. Seek the face of God over your ministry. When last did you and your wife and say, let us pray. We need to pray for Papa. We need to pray for our children. We need to pray for our grandchildren. We need to pray for the church. We feast, we don't fast. Because feasting is easier than fasting. They lost focus. 16 years they were doing well. And I'm asking you, young man, you were running for God. They kept saying, the time has not yet come to rebuild the temple. They did not deny that it was their responsibility. But they kept putting it off for another day. Let me ask you, when has the Lord been speaking to you about involvement in ministry and you keep putting it off? Lord, you know, when I get married... Lord, when I had children, you keep putting it off. When I get another job, you keep putting it off. And you keep on postponing it. And you forget that every day brings you nearer either to the grave or to the coming of the Lord. Every day, every day subtracts from the days you are going to live upon earth. You keep putting it off. You keep delaying. They knew what to do. Now we know that those 16 to take that. God knows. I understand the problem of these people because it was a time of economic struggle and it was a time of political instability. So to put off the rebuilding of the temple properly made sense from human perspective. Sincerely. The economy was bad. There was political instability. So they were justified, at least from human standpoint, to say, well, we'll postpone it when the economy is good, when the political situation is all right, then we'll do it. But God is not going to take that. God knows that the real problem was not the economy. The real problem was misplaced priorities among God's people. That is why God is asking them, is it a time for you to be living in, a pan in your paneled houses while the temple remains a ruin? Despite their financial struggles, listen, <laughs> this is interesting. Despite their financial struggles, they had enough money to panel their homes. Did you hear me? Despite the fact that things were not okay economically, they had enough time to remodel their homes and make their homes comfortable and leave the house of the Lord unpaneled is misplaced priorities. It's me first. That's the problem. Their focus was on themselves. I was telling my brothers and sisters this weekend as, we're talking, as we were talking about holiness, I said, do you realize that the problem of sin is the one letter in the middle? I Every, the problem of sin in the letter in the middle, I, 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 they concentrated on themselves. And I told them, I said, is it, is it an accident that the word I in Greek is the word ego? E when you say somebody is egomaniac, ego. And like somebody says, ego simply stands for edging God out. Edging God out. You put yourself in the middle. You put yourself in the center. You become your own priority. You will remember the commercial, it's your thing. <laughs> you do what you want to do. Misplaced priorities. It becomes about us, not about God. Church, God is challenging us this morning. You see, this is not what I'm preaching in the second service. This is what the Lord has for you. I'm preaching something else for the second service. So if you want to wait, you could wait. I'm preaching something totally different, okay? 
I mean, that's the way the Lord is leading me. But for this congregation this morning, this is what is meant for you. Diagnosing misplaced priorities. That's number one. Although the temple of God has changed from the Old Testament to the New Testament, it's just true today. How we spend our time, our money reveals our true priorities. The way we spend our time, our money, and our money actually reveals our true priorities. Because it's what you love most you spend time with. We always have time for whatever we want to do. I, I share this with you. I always have to rebuke myself. You see, I go generally in the morning by around quarter to four or quarter after four, I'm on the greenway. I want to walk about seven miles early in the morning. I walk about seven miles in the morning, and when I leave the seminary in the evening, I go spend another one and a half hours in the gym. So I, averagely, I do a workout of three to four hours a day. But I always ask myself, wait a minute, are you giving as much time to reading your Bible? I have, nobody has to talk to me, I have to talk to myself. <laughs> Nobody's going to preach that to me, but I have to talk to myself. And I, I tell you, the, the reason, that when I do all that walking, when I do all that walking, I have my Bible, I'm listening to the Bible, I am praying, I'm seeking the face of God as I'm walking, and I'm doing all that because I want to make sure that I don't concentrate on this, which will eventually decay and be gone. Whatever we want to do, we have time for. You bet that. When you want to really do something, you have time for it, and you have the money for it. You have the time for it, you have the money for it. Your time, the way you spend your time and your money dictate, shows what your priorities are. Number one, diagnosing misplaced priorities. Number two, the consequences of misplaced priorities. When we don't put God first, what happens? Look at it from verse 5. Now, therefore, thus says the Lord of hosts, consider your ways. God says, consider your ways. You see, I always see the church as a family. So when I preach, I see myself talking to family members, which is what I'm doing this morning. I see myself talking to family members and being able to tell each other the hard truth and say, well, hey, family, let's look at this. What are we doing? What are we doing right? What does God want us to do? Are we members of the same family? Yes. Do you agree with me? You see, that's why I have the boldness to talk to you. And apart from that, I'll talk to you for 30 minutes. I'll be gone, and Pastor Mark will be cleaning up the mess after I'm gone. <laughs> I won't be here when he's doing that. <laughs> the consequences of misplaced priorities. God says, consider your ways. You see, we learn that when we edge God out of our priorities, life stops working for us. When we leave God out of our priorities, listen, life stops working for us. We need to put God where he belongs. Put God where he belongs, at the center of our lives. Otherwise, we cheat ourselves. We keep on laboring. And nothing happens. The first command that God gives them in trying to help them is to spend time in self-reflection and self-evaluation to reflect and revisit their priorities. And a guy was trying to help the people to see the cause and effect relationship between their priorities and the problems they have. Because their priorities were wrong, they were struggling. They had expectations that were not met. Listen, you make a choice, but you cannot choose the consequences of your choice. You can make a choice. You have every liberty to make a choice, but you are not in a position to choose the consequences of your choice. The consequences of your choice are determined. 
But you make the choice. But once you make the choice, it's like when a sinner decides not to be saved. When somebody rejects Jesus, you don't decide whether you want to go. To, you, you can't choose whether you want to go to hell or to heaven. That's already decided. You choose whether you want Jesus. If you choose him, you go to heaven. If you don't choose him, you go to hell. I mean, the consequences are decided. But the choice is yours. But you don't get to choose the consequences of your choice. So when you choose your priorities, you cannot afford to choose the consequence. No, you cannot. And God tells them, please consider your ways. They expect a lot each time they planted their seed, yet when harvest time came, they were continuously disappointed. Why? Because they did not place God first. If you don't hear anything I have said this morning at all, go with this just one sentence. I need to put God first. If you don't hear anything I have said, just remember, you have to tell your wife, you have to tell your husband, tell you, we need to put God first. Because that's the only way. That's the only way you can find fulfillment. That's the only way you can find joy. When my older son wanted to get married a few years ago, I called him before the day he got married. I said, let me have a word with you before you get married. I mean, I'm sure he was afraid I was going to preach to him. But I wasn't, <laughs> I wasn't going to preach. I just called him. I said, let me talk to you. I said, only a few words. I said, this is what I can tell you. Your marriage will last for long or short, depending on one thing, what you put at the center. That's all I told him. It is what is at the center of your marriage that will make it either to last, endure, or to crumble. I said, if you put childbearing, at the center of your marriage, if it happens that you don't have children, your marriage will collapse. If you put money and career at the center of your marriage and you don't make money, your marriage will collapse. But if you put Jesus at the center of that marriage, regardless of what happens, child, child or no child, money or no money, career or no career, whatever happens and whatever doesn't happen, if you put Jesus right at the center of that marriage, I guarantee you, your marriage will last long. And I told him, let me pray for you. That's all I can tell you. And I'm telling you this morning as well, whatever is at the center of our lives. I sang a little song for my students over this week, I mean, what we used to sing in Sunday school, J-O-Y, J-O-Y, this is what it means. Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. J-O-Y, J-O-Y, this is what it means. Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. Jesus first, yourself last, and others in between. If that's your life, you succeed. That's why most of us are not joyful. Why? Because it is me first, Jesus next, and others last. That doesn't spell joy. If it is yourself first, others in between, Jesus last, what you have is your G, <laughs> not joy. So if you want to have joy, it has to be Jesus first. And it's an irony. I go into some houses, and there's Jesus is the center of this house, is the head of this house, the, the silent listener in every conversation. And it is interesting, most of the houses where I've seen that poster, they put him at the corner. I say, how do you say Jesus is the head of the house and you put him in the corner? Because in reality, that is where they placed him in their lives. Where is Jesus in your home? In the center or in the corner? And look at them. God says, consider your ways. I mean, consider your ways. We have a thousand and one excuses for why we edge God's priorities out of our lives. But in the end, we will pay a steep price. 
when we don't do the will of God and refuse to heed his voice, we will end up paying a steep price. You see, I neither prophesy nor prophesy lie. Okay? <laughs> I don't prophesy and I don't prophesy lie. So I don't consider myself a prophet. But I'm declaring the word of the Lord to you, congregation, this morning, that it is time for us as individuals and members of families, as a congregation, to revisit our priorities. What are priorities about? Are they about the kingdom of God? Or are we building our own kingdom? Are you building your own kingdom? Are, where is God in your life? Where is God in your career? Where is God in your finance? Where is God in your home? What time do we spend with God? I am saying that we need to come back to God and love him the way we should love him. We need to come back to God and pray the way we should pray. We need to come back to God and read the word the way we should read the word. We need to come back to God and run for him again and do what God has called us to do and stop playing games with God. And stop playing games with God and stop kidding with God. And say, God, I want to love you. Oh, one of the songs that has blessed my life so much, the title of the song is, My Goal is God Himself. My brothers, my sister, I don't care whether heaven is street of gold or is chrysoprasus or jacinth or burial, those songs I don't care about. Whether it's street of gold or street of diamond, I don't know the difference between diamond and gold. I haven't seen either of them. So I don't care. But my goal is God himself. Whether the street is made of dust or not dust, my goal is God himself. I just want to see him for my eyes to behold the Lord in his beauty and say, this is the God I've been preaching about. This is the God I've been talking about. I want to see him and just lay down my crown at his feet. That should be your desire. That should be my desire. That should be your goal. That should be my passion. We are running the rat race to make two ends to meet. We deceive ourselves. You see, we want to make two ends to meet. Who has ever done it? Two ends are not designed to meet. Did you hear me? If there are two ends, they are designed to be two ends. They are not designed to meet. That's why we call them two ends. This is one end. This is another end. If you want these two ends to meet, you have to destroy this building. You want this end and this end to meet, you have to collapse the building. These two ends are not designed to meet. And we waste all our life and energy and strength trying to make two ends to meet. So you don't come to church, you don't come to Sunday school, you don't come to, you don't even have time to pray. It's not, you see the Pentecostal version in, in the Catholic church in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. That's in the, in the Catholic church. What is the Pentecostal version? Hallelujah, Jesus, hallelujah, Jesus. That's it. You, you are going out of the house in the morning. You forget you did not pray. So you step up and say, Hallelujah, Jesus. Amen. Glory, glory. Blah, 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 blah. And that's it. Listen, I'm a Pentecostal. I speak in tongues. Okay? And I'm not ashamed of it. But if that is all we hold on to, if that is all we hold on to, two minutes prayer, prayer that does not kill mosquito, how would, it, how would you attack the devil with it? I mean, a prayer that can't kill mosquitoes. Get away in Jesus' name. And the mosquitoes say, which Jesus' name are you talking about? You don't even know him. You are not even his friend. So how, how do you say that? The consequences are misplaced priorities. But you see, there's a solution. There's a solution. What is the solution? You see the solution in verses 12 to 15. God told them what they needed to do. Zerubbabel said, the son of Shealtiel and Joshua, the son of Jehoshaphat, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the people showed reverence. That's it. Solution. The fear of the Lord. 
if we want our priorities, if we want the favor of God in our lives, we need to realign our priorities and to make sure that God himself is working in our lives. You see, I don't have a lot of time because we have the second service starting shortly. But I think you've had enough. And I think I've said enough. You need, to, you need to do something with what you've had. And say, God, I have placed you in the back burner. I have put you at the back seat when you are supposed to be on the driver's seat. Who is driving the van of your life? You or God. You've taken your life into your hand. Give it back to him. Give it back to him. Let's rise up for prayer. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. God says, as many as I love, I rebuke. I believe this is the love of God for us this morning. That he has felt it necessary to challenge us, to encourage us, to instruct us. So why don't you just take a moment to pray? Just open your mouth and pray and talk to the Lord. David said, let the righteous smite me, it shall not hurt me. Let the righteous rebuke me, it shall be like the ointment, it shall be like the oil running on the head of Aaron to his beard. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. Father, we want to thank you for this morning. You know your children. You know where we all are. You know how to get across to us. We want to thank you for your word, for your spirit. We want to thank you for you have shown yourself that you love us. And Lord, this morning we receive your word with fear, with trembling. We receive your word with joy. And Lord, I'm just asking, including myself, each and every one of us this morning, who have misplaced our priorities, will be able to reflect and reevaluate and run back to you again. And go back to you where we left you. Lord, I'm praying that you renew the altars of prayers in our families. I'm praying for a revival in every home that is represented in this church. A revival of seeking your face, a revival of prayer that things will be happening in our homes and in our lives. And that you move in a new way. You move in a new way, in a powerful way than we've ever experienced you. Lord, for those who are going on their own ways, walking on the way of sin, who are neglecting you and forsaking you, forgetting there's a consequence and a price to pay, the price of eternity in hell. I pray for such people. This morning, if they are here, that Lord, you will rechannel themselves to you, repent of their sins, and turn their lives over to you. The backsliders will be restored. You renew our love, our commitment, and our dedication to you and to your will. And in doing so, we'll find joy, peace, hope, fulfillment. Thank you, Heavenly Father. We bless you and we worship you. In Jesus' name, amen. word. How many of you can say today that something of what he said hit home with you? Can I see him? Yeah. He's a good father. Oftentimes we focus on all the wrong things. We make the wrong thing the main thing and then we get all clouded. Thank God for the word of the Lord. I'm grateful for Dr. Ottawa. He's had a lot of influence in my life so blame him for a lot of me. Um, no. He's a, he's a wonderful man. I've been in more of his classes than any other professor at the seminary. And he's a dear man, as you've, as you've experienced, and those in the class. 
want to close us in prayer, and I want you to take the opportunity to, to greet him, but we're going to be transitioning into our discipleship time. Uh, we're going to give grace to each other these first couple weeks as we kind of learn the new ropes of things, so I'm asking uh, no leaders be rude to anybody and say, you're supposed to be in there. This, it's all right. Okay, don't take yourself so serious. Um, but this is something new that we're transitioning into. And, but I believe it'll be, um, as it grows, uh, a continual blessing. But let's pray. Father, thank you for Dr. Adewuya and, and the, your word to us today. Thank you for his ear to hear. I don't know what you'll say to us the second service, but we're eager to hear. I pray, Lord, that for the next few moments, as we transition into something new that we've not done here before, that you would give grace to those that are part of it. And Lord, that you would help us in a time of discipleship, both now and as we move forward, that we would be instructed by your word, that we would grow, that you would be the priority of all things in our life, that it'd be more than just a talk that we have, but it'd be the life that we proclaim and live. Bless your people today. Meet each need. Let the word that was deposited in our hearts today resonate throughout the day that we might be continually made in your image. And we'll give you thanks for it through Jesus Christ our Lord. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. God bless you. Discipleship time. I know the adults will be right over here to my right, to your left. But take a moment. Don't forget to greet Dr. Ottawa, and we'll see you in just a bit. Jesus.